What's up, you fam? Today we continue on our third week of our series, Crosswords, looking at the forsaken. What does that mean exactly? What did Jesus mean when he told his disciples he was going to be betrayed? You know, it didn't make any sense to them. What does it mean to us now when we look at it? What can we learn from it? Jesus literally experienced separation from God for us. Scripture was fulfilled by him being forsaken. Pastor Barry's going to unpack that for us shortly. So don't forget to grab what you need for the Lord's Supper. Let's worship together.
morning, church family. It is so good to see those of you who are here in the building worshiping with us this Sunday. Hey, thanks for everyone who's tuning in online and, and being here this morning with us. Hey, I want to real say quick, real quick say that if you are new with us, if this is your first time, uh, we would love to connect with you as a church. And so there are connection cards in the chair backs in front of you. And if you're online for the first time, there's a link in the comments you can fill out uh, as much information as you're comfortable sharing with us. And, and we'd love to just tell you a little bit more about our church and how you can plug in and be a part of the family here. But we are in our series today uh, called Crosswords. And uh, we're going to hear a message from Barry, and it, it's a powerful message, guys. So I, I want to encourage you to lean in, because we're going to be talking about how Jesus took our place uh, and chose to be forsaken so that you and I wouldn't have to, and that we could be restored and redeemed. And it's an awesome message. But for now, we're going to continue on in worship, so please stay standing as we worship.
Thank you. Hey, as we enter into communion time here, I just want to, there's only one name, Jesus. There's only one way that our soul can be saved. There's only one person who has come to this world and he's conquered sin and death for you and for me. And it's the reason we take communion each and every week. And so uh, on the right side of each row, we have these buckets uh, with communion. If you would take those and pass them down the aisle. 
We're going to go into our time of communion right now. And I wanted to share out of Luke chapter 22. Jesus is with his disciples and the the Passover meal is coming. And it says that he, he sends Peter and John ahead to the city to a man's house where they're going to meet a man where they can prepare for the meal. And as Jesus and his disciples, they come, they come to this house. And what I love about this moment is that Jesus is coming to the end of his life. He, he knows he's about to go to the cross and he's going to suffer. And he chooses to table with dear friends. He chooses intimacy and relationship with those closest to him and those that he loves and that had followed him, that he had taught, that that would go and spark what we know as the church throughout history. And as he tables with them, he grabs the bread, Luke 22 tells us, and it says that he he picks up the bread and he breaks and he says, hey, this is my body and it's gonna be broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And then they they go on and they have their meal and, and it says that at the end he takes the cup and he says, This is to represent my blood, which is going to create a new covenant. Drink and remember me. And so as we take communion each and every week, that's the offer on the table. Jesus was sitting with Peter who would deny him, Judas who would betray him and turn him over. He was sitting with Messi and Broken. If you keep reading, it says that they start bickering and fighting about who's the greatest right after they get to have this time with Jesus, right? Like just messy and broken people. And that's what we celebrate each week when we take communion is that Christ, despite our mess, despite our brokenness, he, he did what we couldn't do. He lived a perfect, sinless life for you and for me that we could be redeemed and that we would get his righteousness in exchange. So let's take the bread, which represents Christ's body broken for us, and let's eat it. And let's take the cup which represents his blood shed for you and for me and let's drink. Would you pray with me? God, we love you. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus. God, that he came and he lived the life we couldn't live and he died the death that none of us would choose. And because of it, we put our trust in him and we get his righteousness in return. Not our mess, not our brokenness, but we get the righteousness of Christ. God, we give you thanks for that. Lord, I pray for each and every one in here who has put their trust in you that we would remember and be reminded daily as we go. And and maybe for those who don't know you in here, God, would you open their eyes to the reality and the beauty of your love and your grace. It's in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, let's take a look at this missions moment. Hello, University Christian Church. This is Ethan Greer in Sendai, Japan. It is great to communicate with you again. Thank you so much for supporting us, praying for us, encouraging us. We appreciate our partnership with you. I'm walking through a major shopping center here in Sendai. It's very close to where our church meets. And uh, this time I just have a quick story for you. Uh, Recently, I think it was last week actually, a woman in our church called me and said that there was a, a man, there's a man that she's been meeting with who owns a restaurant. He's a, an older gentleman and uh, his wife and his daughter um, both have cancer. And she has been meeting with him and telling him the gospel and reading the Bible together. And he has been seeking the God of the Bible for a long time. And uh, suddenly and unexpectedly, his daughter's cancer spread and she passed away. And he contacted uh, our church member because he did not want to do a Buddhist funeral. He wanted to do what Christians do. And so uh, I received this phone call and she was asking, can we do something? I've never done a funeral and I've definitely never done a funeral in Japanese, but um, yes, of course we can do something. So uh, I was privileged to 
have the honor to do a funeral ceremony and talk about the God who created all people in his image. And everyone has value and worth. And everyone who believes in Jesus uh, does not need to fear death and can even have hope in the midst of death. Um, there were probably about 150 non-Christian Japanese people in attendance. And so this is just another situation where God is showing that he is in control and God is powerful. And it's through prayers, it's through your prayers that opportunities like this come and the gospel goes forth and the gospel is received. So please continue to pray, pray for this family that they would believe and follow Jesus. The father is actually very close to being baptized, so we're really grateful for that. See you sometime soon, hopefully, University Christian Church. It is wonderful to partner with you here. Hey, as we go into our offering time, each week we share these Missions Moments videos because it's because of faithfulness and generosity and all of us collectively coming together as a church body that we as a church, uh, we give 20% of everything that comes in here goes back out. It goes to our local community, it goes across the country and it goes across the globe, sending out missionaries and supporting organizations who take the gospel both near and far. And I've said it a hundred times, but, but to, to those who you and I may never meet, like Ethan and Sendai, like many of us won't go there, but it's because of the faithfulness and generosity. And what I love about uh, what Ethan said there is he's like, hey, I've never done a funeral and I've never done one in Japanese. And uh, the, the truth is that's, that's probably true for most of us. But what was cool about that and the power of God in that moment was it was not about his ability. It was about his availability and saying yes to Jesus and yes to God and being faithful that he then gets to at a funeral and in a dark moment share the light of Christ with 150 people who were not Christians in a country that's not open to Christianity. That kind of stuff doesn't happen without us doing the same and not focusing on our ability financial, what we think we're able to do, but us saying yes to God and being available with all that he's blessed us with. And so uh, I wanna just encourage and challenge with that. I wanna say thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity. It, we do so much together that not, not a single one of us could do individually. But when we come together as the collective body of Christ and we say, yes, Lord, I wanna be available. God does some amazing things, both near and far. So if you came prepared to give today, there's a couple of ways that you can do that. Uh, you can, as always, drop a physical gift in the black drop boxes as you leave today, or you can text the number on the screen. It takes uh, about 60 seconds, you'll get a prompt, and, and uh, it takes about 60 seconds to do that. Uh, or you can give through the UCC Hub app or on our website at university.church slash give. But while you're taking care of that, we're gonna watch some church news. Prepare your hearts, families, and calendars for Easter. On Good Friday, our chapel will be open 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. for self-guided meditation, worship, and prayer. There's no need to RSVP. Stop by any time throughout the day to engage in this reflection. Easter Jam is Saturday, April 8th at 10 a.m. This is an opportunity for the entire family to worship, play games, and unpack the Easter story. It's free, and there is an Easter egg hunt after. You can find the RSVP in the UCC Hub app or at university.church slash calendar. Easter services will be held at 8, 9, 30, 11 a.m. We know these services tend to attract visitors and new families. We're asking for 100 people from the 9.30 or 11 a.m. service to commit to 8 a.m. for Easter, which will make room for new friends who are joining us that day. As an added bonus, 8 a.m.ers will get donuts. Not just any donuts, Varsity Donuts. If you're a 9.30 or 11 a.m.er who can commit to the 8 a.m. service, RSVP in the UCC Hub app under events or at university.church slash calendar. If you want a recap of all things Easter, visit university.church slash Easter. Baptism Sunday follows Easter on April 16th. 10 volunteers each service are needed, and it can be during the service you attend. These volunteers help celebrate those who've made the decision to be baptized. Whether that's holding personal belongings, giving them a towel, welcoming them into our family, 
It's such a special way to be a part of the action and be with those who have made this decision. You can find the link to serve under the Serve tab of the UCC Hub app or at university.church slash raised to life. As we approach a few busy Sundays, we wanted to remind you about parking. We've got parking available across Browning from Commerce Bank all the way down to Nichols Chiropractic. Please help us keep parking lots in the upper and lower lots available for those with mobility issues, our older attendees, and parents with small children. We don't want anyone who needs direct access to circle the parking lot and choose to go home because they don't see that there's room. Thanks for helping keep our church accessible and welcoming. Last fall, we had our first Love the Little Apple Serve Day. Five different organizations were cared for by almost 150 of our church family, who are the hands and feet of Jesus together. This Spring Serve Day will be held Saturday, April 22nd from 9 to noon. You can find the registration in the Events tab of the UCC Hub app or at university.church slash calendar. We'll be serving four different sites, and all who serve will get a Love the Little Apple t-shirt. Again, that's April 22nd. You can follow along with us throughout the week at university.church in the UCC Hub app, university.church on Instagram, or UCCMHK on Facebook. series called Crosswords, that it, it's taking some of the words, the final sayings of Jesus as he's headed towards the cross, as he's dying there, what does he say? Obviously, these are nuggets. They're incredible gifts of wisdom that set up so much of what we understand faith to be today. And today, before we jump in, just as we think about Easter, Easter is such a great opportunity to reach out to friends, to family, to neighbors, coworkers who might not regularly attend anywhere. I found they are so open. If you say, hey, would you join me for Easter service? Not just, you ought to go to church, but would you join me? Could I pick you up? Could I take you? Uh, that is a great opportunity to invite. More often than not, You'll get a yes, especially on a big day like this. So great opportunity to reach out, bring somebody else to hear the message. And for those who do wake up earlier and just come at 11 because it's later and you're not real grumpy, we'd love to have you consider coming at 8 a.m., bring your friends there too. Uh, but if you're real grumpy early in the morning, please come at 11, don't come early. And we're going to give you donuts if for those who do come. Well, hey, as we approach Easter... There's a misunderstanding around this whole idea of like first plan failing, second plan, let's try it again, different way. Old Testament, New Testament. We have the garden, we have Adam and Eve, sin enters in and oh no, people do something dumb. There's, there's sin in the world. What are we going to do? Oh, well, let's come up and let's have Jesus no, 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 no. It's not plan one and then plan two. From the beginning, this was the plan of how to redeem. See, God doesn't get surprised like we think of. And so when you read through the Old Testament, everything in there is about our need for a Savior. There's prophecy after prophecy after prophecy, hundreds of prophecies about how Jesus is going to come, how he's going to live, how he's going to die. 
And we're going to look at one of those today, one that you don't even realize as he's speaking on the cross, he's actually bringing back a prophecy from a thousand years previous. And then we have the New Testament where Jesus comes and he sets up his church and we now are in the days of preparing for when he comes again. But here's the problem. Um, we hear what we want to hear and we tend to ignore what we don't like. That's been a human condition all the way back. And so when we read about the disciples being, what's going on? How, Jesus, what? I, I can't believe he's, oh no. They were totally caught off guard because they didn't listen the same as you don't listen, the same as I don't listen. See, let's just open up in Matthew chapter 20. Beforehand, Jesus told his disciples, all right, guys, you can't get more blunt than this. And they're like, oh, yeah, he's probably talking in riddles. He doesn't really mean it. We're going to go up to Jerusalem while the Son of Man is going to be betrayed to the leading priest and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die. Then he's going to be handed over to the Romans to be mocked, to be flogged with a whip and crucified. And on the third day, he's going to be raised from the dead. And they didn't get it a bit. When it happened, they were caught off guard. They were surprised. They had no idea. And, you know, here's the thing. <laughs> I identify with that. You should as well if you're honest about it. You know, I, we all know. You know, we know that there's problem. There's a problem in this world called we're all going to die. We know that we're going to get sick and we're going to get old. We're going to get frail. Things go wrong. We know that war happens. We know disease happens. We know that we could drop dead from an accident. We could get hit by a car, right? We all know that. But it's going to happen to somebody else, not, not me. Jesus said, in this world, you'll have trouble. It's going to happen. There are going to be problems. This is not heaven. And then the disciples, when he told them clearly, this is what's going to happen. <gasps> when it happens in our life, <gasps> well, wait a second, death in my family? Wait a second, the, the diagnosis for me? Well, that's not the plan, God. How, how, how could this have happened? And hmm, we always get caught off guard by pain. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. He had some very specific things to say. And interestingly, just enough, by the way, when someone hung on a cross, history shows they didn't talk at all, hardly at all, because it was so painful to pull against the, the spikes, to push against the spikes, to breathe. The only way they could talk was all they could do. And and he actually goes ahead and uses that painful moment to share things with us that we don't want to miss. Matthew chapter 27, it says, From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Hmm. I'm so glad that's in the scripture. See, before we go into tearing it apart or talking about it, I'm so glad that Jesus in this instant asked why. It's one time. It's the only time he ever asked why. But it also should make it very clear to you and me that it's okay to ask why. Jesus did. I asked why with war. I asked why with death. I asked why with sickness. I asked why with COVID. I asked, I asked why with mosquitoes and ticks and spiders. A lot of things I asked why, and God's big enough. He can handle it. Now, he's a big God, and he loves us, even in the spite of our struggles and our complaining. You know, David, a man after God's own heart in the Old Testament, Says in Psalm 142, I cry out to the Lord. I plead for the Lord's mercy. I pour out my complaints before him and tell him all of my troubles. Oh, God's a big God. He can handle your complaints and your troubles as you pour them out as well. See, a theologian, Clovis Chappelle, writes this of that passage. He says, these words, the, the psalm that we just read, they come to us out of a long gone past. We first hear them from the lips of this ancient psalmist, but 
He was doubtless not the first to utter them. They have been either articulate or inarticulate upon the lips of countless millions of perplexed men and women as the years come and have gone. Who among us has gotten very far into life without having wrung from this tearful cry? This is a question that has literally sobbed its way through the centuries. It is, in a sense, an outcry of humanity. It is as old as man. It is as new as the pain of your own broken heart. You know, when we look in the New Testament at Jesus' encounter with a, a close family that he was friends with, Lazarus and, and his two sisters, Mary and Martha. <laughs> Lazarus died, and when he got there, Mary and Martha basically were yelling at him, Why? Why weren't you here? If you had been here, it wouldn't have happened. Why? And his response wasn't anger, it wasn't frustration. He wept with them. Oh, the compassionate heart of our God, I'm so thankful for. You know, uh, what you might not realize about this passage, when we read, as Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This was actually kind of school in session for the Jews. What I mean by that, he was being very clear with something, and if they were listening, he was about to teach what was happening. He was the rabbi teaching. See, when rabbis would teach, the Jewish culture was a verbal. It was one that they would memorize tremendous amounts of things. And, and so the Psalm chapter 22 would be a psalm that they would have memorized. And when a rabbi would teach on it, he would say the first sentence, they're expected to say the rest. So what does Psalm 22 actually say? He says, my God, my God, a thousand years written before the time of the cross, word for word, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If they were listening, the rest of what is happening is unfolding a thousand years before crucifixion. Ain't crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet at this point. Let's read on. Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I do not find rest. Hey, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It is melted within me. My mouth is dried up. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Isn't this incredible? So he quoted the first. What happened? He's prophe it's his prophecy coming true at this moment. I mean, his hands, his feet being pierced. Hey, the crowd mocking him, saying, oh, I never, hey, hey, all this stuff is what's going on at the moment. It should have been a, oh, moment for the Jews standing and watching. Now, why? Why would they not get it? Well, the same reason that you and I don't get it. You have to be paying attention. Here's the problem. You and I are very comfortable with the darkness. You and I have become very accustomed to the darkness of this world. In fact, the darkness of my heart, I've become accustomed to. The problems in my life, I've become accustomed to. The consequence of the sin in my heart, I've become accustomed to. And that's a dangerous place to be. We have become accustomed to sin, and we kind of downplay it. You know, it was prophesied in Isaiah 53, 700 years prior to the time of Christ, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We have left God's path to follow our own. Now, now don't miss that right there. We've left our path. Hey, we've left his path for our path. That's really a definition of sin. Do you get me? 
It's not a matter of, oh, if I murder someone, if I commit adultery, if I, if I just do these horrible drunken or I, 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 no, no, no. It's just doing life your way instead of God's way. Might be something horrible. It might just be being kind of selfish. It might just be living with a proud attitude. And yet the Lord laid on him, Jesus, 700 years ahead of time. He says, the iniquity is of us all. So God gathers the, the murder of Cain at the beginning of the scripture. He right in the middle takes the adultery of David. He takes all the atrocities of history. He takes Barry Park's mess and yours and put them on the shoulders of Jesus. And now here's the beautiful part that we share in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians says, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ Jesus. Jesus literally bore our guilt. So Jesus experienced hell for you and for me. Jesus was separated from God the Father because of the consequence of my sin, the consequence of your sin. See, sometimes there's this confusion about, well, well, what's going on? How can God the Father forsake the Son? How could he do that at that moment? Remember, Jesus is fulfilling prophecy. He is quoting Psalm 22. This must happen. And now Jesus stands in between heaven and hell with a foot in each and a home in neither, and he did so for us so that we could be forgiven. In The Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, he writes of Sidney Carlton and Charles Darnay. He, he shares this incredible story during the French Revolution where we have Darnay who is going to be killed and punished for the sins of his forefathers, and he is about to be on trial. He is hours before execution, actually. Sidney visits him. And after the guard left, as he came near him, he used anesthesia to, to anesthetic to actually knock him out, change his, his clothes with him. And then he calls the guard and says, hey, take, take, take this visitor back to his home. And he's just overwhelmed with grief. And so he takes now the prisoner out of the dungeon and the free man stays in the dungeon. He was led to his death and Sidney Carlton now, come on, English lit majors, you guys know what he said. It is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. Yeah, so there you go. English majors, you can text your mom and said, I put my, my thousands of dollars to use with, the, yeah, I knew the quote the preacher shared. You know, here's what we can grab hold of on this. Jesus, where did his life lead to? What did his love cause him to do? It led him to a cross where he died for you and me. See, he came into my dungeon, your dungeon, and he exchanged his clothes of righteousness with our clothes of sin, and he walked into this to death where he went to a cross while we walked to freedom. That's amazing grace. You know, written 700 years before the time of Christ was Isaiah 53, as I said. Let's just pull a little more of that out. Yet it was our weakness that Jesus carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be made whole he was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. <laughs> you know, a few months back, I was driving down I-70. And I was coming to a construction zone. I was in the left-hand lane. I was going at below the speed limit, no, no problems there. And there was a car going really slow in the right-hand lane, so I just naturally kind of went by, and then it went from two down to one, and I'm going through the construction zone, get out on the other side, and all of a sudden in my rearview mirror, 
And I'm like, what did I do? I'm like, ah. I'm just immediate. Ching, 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 ching. Insurance is going to go up. I'm going to have to pay a ticket. I'm just frustrated. I get pulled over. I'm getting my stuff out. I'm a little bit nervous. And, and I roll my window down. Officer walks up to the window and says, well, Pastor Barry. I'm like, what? <laughs> he says, I don't know if you realize, but it's illegal to pass anyone in a construction zone. No matter what speed they're going. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> and, well, he had fun. He got to tell a small group and laugh about how he pulled the pastor over. I got grace because he gave me a warning. That is not justice. See, justice, I broke the law accidentally, but I broke the law. He gave me grace. Now, here's the thing and comes to God. I, I didn't break the law once with God's law. I have a problem called sin. Now, I, I've been alive for a while now. In fact, as of today, 19,243 days I've been alive and counting. Hopefully, I get to keep adding for a while. And, you know, I have sinned at least once every day. I can guarantee that. There have been many times, it's been multiple times, and so I don't know how many thousands upon thousands upon thousands of sins I've committed in my life. But they are what drove the spikes into Jesus' wrists and into his feet. That's what the cross does for me. That's grace. That's amazing grace. The nature of the problem generates the cost of the treatment. Let me say that again. The nature of the problem. If you get sick, if you go to the hospital, if you got a, a, the, the worse the problem, the deeper, the bigger, the more life-threatening it is, generates the higher cost of the treatment. You get that, right? Someone goes into the ICU, they're fighting for their life. I mean, it, you know, if they get life-flighted, jing, 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 the cost is going way up. So the treatment for our problem is the cross, the death, the beating, the mockery of our Lord. So what does that say about our problem? It's a serious problem. It's not just a matter of, oh, boys will be boys. Oh, she's just a girl. It's just a kid. It's no big deal. Oh, you know, it's, it's, it's you, know, you know, that's just, the, oh, it's just life. It's not that big a deal. Oh, everybody does it. We downplay God's grace to feel better about ourselves, and then we depreciate, we, we mock almost the cross at the same time. If not careful, we don't realize what's going on. Jesus paid the cross for my sin. There's something messed up within me that needed paid for, and that doesn't end there, though. Don't, don't just stop there. See, the good news, I'm not just saying, I want you to know how messed up you are. No, I'm saying how messed up we are. What I want you to go is when you realize the depth of your sin, when you realize the pain in your own life, when you realize what it cost, you go, whoa, Jesus did that for me? It raises the level of the payment. See, I, I want to go back to Psalm 22. See, the chapter doesn't just end with all the bad that happens. I love what the result is of his giving of all this punishment, of the hurt. It says, I'll declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. That's the response. You who fear the Lord, praise him. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. See, he does not forsake. Even in the prophecy, he's like, God is right there in the midst. God the Father has not left. And, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn. We praise him because of the result when we realize the price that was paid that was the result of our mess. 
See, here's the beauty of the whole thing. The bottom line of the sermon is that Jesus was forsaken so that I don't have to be, so that you don't have to be. He was forsaken in our place. See, I want to ask you to do something for just a moment. I want you to think about the thing in your life that you are most ashamed of. I know you have something in your head just like I do. Guess what? Jesus paid for that. So when you think of that thing that you've been beating yourself up for and you're ashamed and you want to hang your head, please hear me. Jesus was already beat up for that. You don't have to beat yourself up. The thing you're most ashamed of, he paid for that. That's why it says in the New Testament, post-resurrection, after the death, the payment's been made, the resurrection coming in glory. What is the result for us? Romans chapter 5, it says, so now we can rejoice in a wonderful new relationship with God. We can rejoice. Why? Because Jesus has made us friends of God. That's amazing, friends. Brazil has a remarkable facility. Around 20 years ago, the government had turned a prison, an institution in a prison over to two Christians, and it was renamed Humaita, with the plan to run it on Christian principles. There was only two full-time staff as they opened this up. All the work is done by the prisoners. All the volunteers are of the inmates, families around the institution actually adopt during and after their term prisoners. Chuck Colson, uh, whose ministry is to deal with prisons around the world, writes this of his visit. I found the inmates smiling, particularly the murderer who held the keys and opened the gates to let me in. Wherever I walked, I saw men at peace. I saw clean living areas, people working industriously. The walls were decorated with biblical sayings from Psalms and Proverbs. My guide escorted me to the notorious prison cell once used for torture. Today, he told me, that block houses only a single inmate. As we reached the end of a long concrete corridor, he put the key in the lock. He paused and he asked, Are you sure you want to go in? Well, of course. I replied impatiently. I've been in isolation cells all over the world. And slowly he swung open the massive door. And I saw the prisoner in that punishment cell, a crucifix beautifully carved by the Humaita inmates, the prisoner Jesus, hanging on a cross. My guide said softly, he's doing time for the rest of us. That's my truth. That's your truth. As we close out today, I'm actually going to ask my dad, come up here. He's my mentor. My, my, he's been uh, so much in my life. And so I'm going to ask him to say the prayer over you and over me. He's probably displayed more grace in my life than any other person. So, Dad, would you please join me over here? Would you pray for us, please? Father in heaven, we thank you that we can come together on this first day of a new week to sing praise to you and to feel your presence in our heart, to worship you, adore you. Lord, we pray that you'll help us to be forever grateful of your tremendous grace that you've given to us and yet you'll keep us close to you and close to one another that we can encourage one another and build one another up and as we leave this morning lord we pray that you'll help us to see the opportunities we have to share that grace with others that they too can have the same hope in jesus that we have We ask you to dismiss us with your blessing, keep us in your care, and use Jesus to be honored through him. In his name we pray, amen.
Would you please stand with us? As we approach Easter coming up soon, I challenge you to think about the message today. Review the past few messages, the past few weeks. Are you thirsting for God? Do you need to know Him? Maybe you haven't surrendered your life to Him. Is there a lack of forgiveness in your heart? As believers, Barry shares with us this past week. It'll hold you back. And finally today, maybe you feel forsaken. Maybe you feel tossed aside by friends, family, loved ones. Maybe there's things that need to be surrendered to God that He can change. Moving forward in the week, if you need anything, prayer, resources, or support, head to university.church slash ufam. We are here for you to be with you so we can love God, people in the world, from wherever you are. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Was it age? I remember who I was. I was lost, I was blind, I was running out of time. Sin separated, the bridge was far too wide. But from the far side, So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's stone to build it here inside. And there, at the cross, you paid the debt I owe, broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time.
Amen. Church, it's been so good to worship with you. We pray that you walk in the confidence of who Jesus is and what he's done for you. Have a great week.